everyone. Welcome to today's uh, special event, Pick Up Back to Works Q&A with Jonathan Pickup. Join us for a special Q&A with CAD guru Jonathan Pickup. Jonathan is trained as an architect with more than 30 years of experience, and he has been writing and producing VectorWorks manuals and providing customer support for more than 20 years. His company, Archon CAD, is the premier provider of third-party manuals and training resources for VectorWorks. He offers monthly webinars for VectorWorks and maintains the visual knowledge base for VectorWorks. Jonathan, as I said, joins us from New Zealand. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about Novedge. Novedge is changing the way designers purchase 3D software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice, and faster service. As you know, Vectorworks 2021 is coming out. And we want to make sure you're aware that if you buy or upgrade to Vectorworks 2020 now, you will be automatically be able to get the version 2021 for free as soon as it releases. So as you can see, we have a promo that will allow you to save 25% on new licenses or upgrades, plus we'll give you a free year of back to work service select. Check it all out at novage.com or call us anytime. Our phone number is really on every page of our web stores. Uh, thanks for listening and enough about me and a lot about Jonathan. So I'm gonna make him the presenter so he can start replying to your questions. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, so this is my website, Concad Knowledge Base. This is where I've stored all of my movies now. So if you're interested, there's a ton of movies in there. Let's get into Vectorworks. We've, got a, we've only got a couple of questions so far. We've got a renovation question and we've got a 3D modeling, sorry, a, a, a DWG question. So first things first, let's have a look at um, the first question, which was importing versus referencing DWG files. So DWG are, are AutoCAD files, DXF, DWG, same thing. I've only got a couple of files that I, can, that I could grab quickly for that question. So we've got here uh, some details that I got from a manufacturer. And when you bring them in, you get an ability in Vectorworks to either import them directly or to reference them. Now the question is, uh, what's the likelihood of these DWG files changing? In this case, I'm importing a window detail. The, the, the chance of them changing, very, very minor. What about if, if I was working with another person? Let's say, for example, I'm working with a traffic engineer and he keeps changing the files. You know, he keeps redesigning the roading. I've got to keep re-importing those. That's when referencing becomes really useful. Now, there are a couple of things worth referencing. Number one is the file has to have the same name. So, for example, when an engineer might send you a DWG file, he might put the date in it. Now, the challenge with that is that when he re-exports it and gives it to you again, it's going to have a different date. That, therefore, it's not going to be exactly the same file name, and therefore, it's not going to automatically reference the way you think so, it will. So maybe an idea would be that when you grab that file from an engineer, um, you notice none of these have got the dates on it. Take the date off it so that you've got sort of the, the name and the engineer's name. That way, when you... when um, they change it, you'll copy the engineer's file into the same location, and then Vectorworks will automatically update that file. So that's so someone asked, when should I do one and when should I do the other? Um, but it also raised the question of referencing. So in Vectorworks, when we reference files together, we can actually reference um, a file from a one Vectorworks file to another. We can reference layers. And we can, we've got two different ways of referencing those. So I think that maybe that's enough for that question. David, does that answer your question about when to do what? I hope so. So a quick answer is if it's something that's coming from a manufacturer and it's not going to be updated, don't reference it. You don't need to. If it's something coming from someone that you know is going to change it, then reference it. Um, but be careful that you reference it, that remember the name has to be consistent. If you choose absolute path, it's a good idea to put your DWG file close to your working Vectorworks file in the same folder 
or in a folder next to it so that it, um, that, that it knows Bigwix knows where to find it. And of course, don't forget to save your settings so that when you use these, they're always consistently the same. Now, one of the things I will say, David, before you import a DXF DWG file, never, never, ever import a DXF file into an existing project until you've checked it. To check it, always import into a blank file and make sure it's got the right units. Uh, here I've got, I can change the units. Um, I can uh, choose the, the units that I'm using there. But don't forget to check all of that stuff. If you need to, um, you're quite right, David. If you import it, you can't manipulate the imported file. You can, of course, break the reference, but then it's no longer referenced. Um, and if you reference a DWG file, it sits in a um, it sits in a viewport in a reference to DWG, and you can move it around. And if you move it, you will be moving that information relative to its origin. But of course, it should remember that once you update the reference. So, David, does that answer your question? I hope so. What's the next question we've got? Uh, for renovation projects. So I've got this project here for, for a renovation to show you how I set up a renovation project. So I like to use, uh, when I'm doing a renovation project, I like to use classes rather than layers to control all of my um, existing, proposed, and demolished. So in this particular view, you can see I've got everything going. I think I've got a layer here where I've got just the proposed plan and the existing and demolition plans. So I like to use, uh, I don't know why we've got one here. We've got, let's get rid of that one. Oh, oh I've got something over the side there. What's that? It must have been the last time I showed this off, I, I drew this thing. Okay, let's get rid of that. Um, so in this case here, you can see that I've got an existing plan and I've got a proposed plan. And the idea is, sorry, this might be a uh, this is a demolition plan and the idea is that we want to see the, the existing and we want to see what walls need to be demolished how do we do that so if I delete one of these let's delete that one um, so some people argue and say that what you should have is an existing layer for or, or a layer for the existing building so you can see the complete untouched building I don't bother with that I what I tend to do is just have a walls layer and the walls layer shows everything at the moment. So it's showing the floor. Let's get, a get rid of proposed walls. Let's get rid of that. Uh, we'll get rid of our services if we can. Um, so these walls here are going to be demolished. And you might notice when I demolish these walls that their graphic style doesn't look like they're going to be demolished. And that allows me to make an existing building. So I can actually go ahead and make a, an existing view like this. And it doesn't look as if the walls are demolished. Now, there are some joints here that shouldn't be there, but otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell that those walls had been changed. Now, I do have some of these walls on a demolition layer. So if I select that viewport, let's look at my classes. We should have one called Walls Demo. Where's Walls Demolished? There we are, Walls Demolished there. So if I turn those off and we'll preview it, you can see they disappear. But the other thing I can do with these walls is I can change their graphic style. So I quite like to make them hatched. I like to give them a, a, a very cross hatch. I think mine's called hard fill. There it is, hard fill hatch. Uh, so I use one of those. I usually give it a very heavy line so that the contractor uh, has trouble not seeing them. And so those are my walls to be demolished. Now what I can do with that if we just undo that, back to my view. I didn't want those demolished like that, so let's find wall. Now, recently I've been using the search area at the top here a lot, because it makes it really quick. So I'm just going to revert all my walls, revert that back. Now, so what I can do is I can create an existing plan and a demolition plan. And so let's do the search again, wall, demo, and we'll do the edit again. Hard fill, select, make it heavy, not too heavy. So it's easy to see where my demolished walls are. But if I make a change, now this is the reason why I do it this way. 
if we go back to my walls layer, let's see, let's say for example, this wall here was going to be demolished. What if we wanted to demolish part of this wall as well? So I'm going to use my split tool. My split tool there. I'm going to split it there and there. Let's say I want to move the door and I want to put a door in here. If I select that and I assign that to the walls demo, then what happens in my sheet layer, so what I'll do is I'll just turn on my multiple view panes. If you don't know what multiple view panes are, they're really cool. So I can see both my drawing and I can see my design. So you can see I've got my new dem demolition plan here. Now the, one of the reasons I use the classes rather than use layers is if I select both those parts of the wall and I go to my reshape tool, I can grab hold of that so I can make a marquee around the two ends where the two walls touch. And I could move that, let's say for example, we move it by a foot, 300 millimeters. Now when I've done that, this drawing has automatically updated. So my demolition plan is up to date with the work I'm doing here. And it, that's the reason I use layers. Uh, so Bill, I hope that answers your question about using the, uh, whether I use layers or classes. I like using classes to manage demolished um, and I use a layer for a story of the building or for a, a you know the, the walls or that sort of, yeah, I use layers for a story of a building really is what I do. And I use classes to control everything else. And it gives me a huge ability to make sure that um, my drawings are consistent, they're easy to change, they you can see the graphic style changes easily. Cool, so that's that one done. Uh, possible to remove points on a contour spline. So Russell, is this contour spline a three-dimensional thing? It's a 3D polygon then. Uh, let me do a 3D poly. Three D, three D polygon. So you, I think you said it was a spline. So I'll start by drawing it as a um, as a polyline. I think. And then we'll convert that to three D polys. So modify, convert to three D polys. So one of the questions I've got. Um, Russell, is why do you need to add or remove points on a contour spline? So this is my problem, Russell, when you have a look at it, there's actually a lot of points on there. Now, if you need to add or remove points because you want to manipulate the, the contour and it's a 3D polygon, why don't we make a site model? and then we can just push and pull it to our heart's content. The challenge we've got, because, because of the way I created it, Vectorworks has converted that to a 3D polygon, and I think if you look carefully, um, Russell, you always end up with this number of points on an object once you've uh, turned into 3D, and you can see that there's a lot of points along there. Is it possible to add a, an individual point? It should be. You can see I've got a plus up here. I should be able to click on here and I should be able to add a point somewhere on there. But I'm wondering why we're doing it because the challenge is that when you add those points, they don't end up at the correct elevation. I'm glad you asked if there's a way to reduce the number of points because that was gonna be my next point. Under modify, drafting aids, there's a simplify polys command. And if you simplify the polys, you can tell it the maximum deviation left or right from the line. So let's give it two inches each way. Now, just before we go, Russell, just have a look over here. 97 vertices on that. Now there's 25. So do you notice a big change in that contour, Russell? I don't, I can see there is a change, but there's not a massive change. And when you double click on it, you can see it's got a, a vastly reduced number of those polygons. So I get some of these, they've got a thousand polylines on them. And after I've edited them, they come out with, with um, less than a hundred. Have I got one I can use? Now, let me see if I can find one, Russell, to see if there's one that I can use. Um, 
Dropbox. Um, I think I've got one here. I think I've got a contour somewhere. Where's it gone? Contours, buildings, curbs. Oh, here we are, I found the contours. Okay, so I've got contours which are, let me bring this in first. Uh, I'm going to bring in a shape file. Did that come in? Shape file. Where's it gone? Got, oh, yeah, sorry, it's over here. There's my dialog box. Yep, so let's import that. Um, and this is the contours of Wellington. And if we have a look, they're 3D polygons. And if I select these, now they're all turned out to be in groups for some reason. So I'm going to select all my groups. I'm going to ungroup them. And that should be now an individual contour. And you can see it's got 2,693 contours. So if I try and make this into a, a site model, Vectorworks is going to struggle a bit. But if I select all of them, and then I go simplify polys, Uh, this this size, I'm going to make it four inches each way. And I think I selected that one previously. It had 2,000 points. It's now got 600. So it's a huge difference in, in the, the amount of data that I have to deal with. And then it should be easy enough to make a site model from that. And once you've got a site model, Russell, remember you can use your site contours or your with site modeling. Uh, you can use stakes to modify it. You can use... Uh, where's my site modifier? You can use site modifiers to move it. These tools are fantastic for shifting the dirt around and to change the style the way you want. So I'd, I'd certainly have a look at those. Um, this is my capital city, Wellington, and it's got a uh, big flat area and then a steep cliff. So I should be able to make uh, a whole bunch of these into a site model reasonably easily. AC, terrain, uh, and... No, no, not site model section. Create site model from source data. And I've got some settings over here. I'm not going to worry about the settings so much. And it should make a site model. And there it is. It's made it already. And it's made it already because I had such easy data to work from because I've reduced the number of points on it. I've got an interaction between my, my original polys and my site model at this point. So, Russell, I hope that answers your question. Um, how to extend multiple lines. Uh, that should be reasonably easy. So uh, it's this tool here that I was going to use, which is the Connect Combine tool. And if you use this one, you can extend multiple lines. So you first of all, you select the boundary object, this one here, and then you just click on each one, and it'll extend those lines to it. Do you want to move them all at once? Well, if you move them all at once, there's not a, there's a, these two here that are parallel. You can't connect those to that one. There are tricks that I've got, such as the reshape tool which is this one here, where you can actually drag the marquee around the reshape tool and then you can stretch those things. But you'll notice it's not stretching the other one to join that line. You really need to use the connect combine tool to do that, which would be that tool uh, and the multiple object connect. Uh, where are we? Uh, custom window, if you have two tilt and tool. Sorry, Jane, I can't read your question. If you have two tilt and turn windows together, how do you change the hinge sides in the custom window? I don't think I've ever had to do that, but let me have a look. We're looking for the window, aren't we? Where's window? Window. So Jane, I might need your help with this one with, with the tilt and turn windows. So settings, we're going to use tilt and turn. Actually, what we want to use is custom. So we're going to have custom sash because you want two, don't you? 
um, two tilt and turn windows together. Um, let's make it a little bit wider. 1600 wide, custom sash options. So number of columns is two. And this one's tilt and turn. And the next one is tilt and turn as well. But you can't, you haven't got any way of changing the size of that. Um, yeah, sorry, Jane, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make that angle go to the other side unless there's some other way of doing it. Unless someone else knows a way and they can just write in the question. Uh, someone's got another suggestion uh, about the uh, stretching the lines. Sorry, Jane, I don't know how to, I can change those in, unless I was wondering whether you can do another trick, which is to leave this on tilt and turn and then change the maximum size of the object. Um, or am I thinking of the other window object? Uh, maximum, so I'm looking for maximum sash width. Is there a maximum sash width on this one? I can't remember. Sorry, Jane, I don't know. I don't know if you can do that. Um, so what was the... Um, what was the... Someone was suggesting another way of doing it. Using the Alt key to... So select that, uh, someone said select that, and then all of the lines, select the limit, then all of the lines and press Alt at the same time, have them all extend. I was that still using the same tool though. So select that, and then so we have to select all of these. I don't think I've, I don't think I know this trick. So you go that one, and then Alt. No, it doesn't work for me. Alt click. Select those. Alt. No. Then all the lines and press Alt at the same time to extend the line. You said you'd select the line, then all of the lines and press Alt to select them all at, oh, I think I got it now. So we go this one, choose that one, then you're using the, uh, I think you said the Alt key, but on the Macintosh, I think that's the Option key, but it's not doing the Command key for me. No, so it might work on the PC, it doesn't work on the Macintosh. Um, so what are we up to? Custom window, I've done that. Door styles versus plugin objects. Do I use a library of door symbols um, versus, so the question is, door styles versus door plugin objects. Do you use a library of door symbols set to the door store style you're using, or do you insert each door as a plugin object, set the style and leave it that way? Using symbols allows the use of the symbol I tool dropper to pick up and place doors, but match the wall thickness doesn't. So the way that I use my door and window objects is I use them as symbols. Uh, actually, I use them as door styles, I should say. So I use window styles, but they're very limited in their ability to change the width of them. So they, although they're door uh, or window styles they're limited to everything except the window number so in a way they are as i've used them so close to being a symbol let me think of it this way um is there something i can show you that so the a, a symbol when we create a symbol it's totally fixed we can't make adjustments to that symbol in the design layer once we've placed it um, the door, um, but if I do, 
but there might be some things I want to change. So when we look at a door, let's let's do a door or window, find a window again. There's my window. So there might be lots of things about this window that I want to remain fixed. And there might be lots of things that I want to use um, to be flexible. And here under the settings, I can choose which settings are going to be flexible and which ones are going to be uh, fixed. So typically uh, in a construction, I would go through something like the, uh, the jam and the sill. And I would set these to the way that I like to work. I use a 25 mil. Uh, 90 millimeter depth, this is 45 for the suites that I use, no shim gap. So I would go through and do a whole lot of these settings. Once I've done a lot of those settings, I would then make that a style. So I then make a new plug and object from that style. I've got a doors and windows folder here. Let's put it in there. And I would call this W01 because it'd be my first window. Now you'll notice that a lot of these things are fixed down here. Let's look at general, all of that's fixed. And I fix everything. This is just the way I use it, except for the ID tag. And I make that flexible. I make that flexible. I make all of these flexible so that I can move them around and I can control them and I can see where they want to go. So, um, Michael, your answer is I use door styles or plug-in styles, um, but they're so controlled, they're almost like a, um, almost like a symbol. The only thing I leave flexible is the ID tag. Now, the reason I do this is because I place one where I live, I have to make a window elevation. Um, I have to make a drawing of every window elevation. It's something like one to 50 so that a contractor can see the sizes of all my windows. Where I live, we don't pick windows from a manufacturer. They're usually made by a local manufacturer. So I need to produce a, a elevation showing all the windows. If I make these a door symbol and tightly control everything except the window number, I can then create, or I can use them like a symbol, and I can place them in plan view one way. In, in one layer, I put them in a plan view. And in a different drawing, I put them, maybe I've got one I can show you. Let me just have a look for one of those. Um, and, then, and then what I do is I put them into a different view. Uh, I need my Architect Asia file. When did I do that? Architect Asia final. This one might have it on. Um, so what I do is I, I, I tightly control them. I use them like a symbol, but the only thing that's flexible is the ability to change the window number. That way, if I've got a bunch of window numbers that are the same style, but different numbers, I don't have to build a different symbol for each one. And then I can use that same window style to create both my plans and my elevations. Oh, it's not here. I was hoping I had it here where I had window elevations. Um, I, I'll need to hunt down a file and find it, but um, that I've got some that are current, but they're, they're for a client. I don't want to show them publicly. Um, what are we up to? How to fill the walls, how to fill the walls solid. Um, in this case here, you can see the wall is not solid. I should be able to use this here, my attributes palette, and I can control it to be solid. However, if I'm using wall styles, then I've got to make sure that I go through my wall style settings. Let's just turn on my proposed wall. Let's update that. Wall proposed, where's wall proposed there? Uh, these are using styled walls. And if we have a look at this, there's actually a wall style here. Let's edit my style and I'll bring my dialog box over. So this is my wall style. This is my structure. And my structure is using something like a class wall structure. And the class controls whether it's got solid fill or not. So if I go back to my wall structure class, wall structure, if we edit that class, I can change that from a pattern to a hatch or to a solid, and that will change all my walls. Let's just undo that and put that back. So that's kind of a handy way of doing it, making sure that you can control those in your drawings. So if I had a drawing here and I had this one, let's pull that drawing over here, uh, this one here, the classes. So this time I'm gonna turn off wall demolished, leave on wall existing, and turn on wall proposed. 
But now if I look at the structure of that, so you can see it's quite dark. Uh, if we have a look at the structure, wall structure, here it is here, let's edit that. I can change this to a solid. I could make it a light gray color if I wanted. And you can see it's changed all the internal parts of my walls. So if you're using a wall style, use classes to control the solid fill. And if you're using just a standard wall, these demolition existing walls, these are unstyled. And they're just a, a wall with no, they've got no components. They've got, uh, and I can just change them directly here on the attributes palette. Um, I'm just having a read of the questions. Someone said the other way, yes, the other way around. What was that yes for? Oh, Flavio was trying to help me, um, and I'm back to prompt with the with the drawing of that. I'll have a look at that, Flavio, and see if I can um, uh, figure it out. Yeah, I don't. I, I I'll try and figure it out on the Mac. Um, How to use the eyedropper to pick up all the elements of the wall, including the wall's height. So James, when you're using the walls, when you're setting the height of the wall, are you also using uh, levels to control the height of the wall? Because I wonder whether that's going to have an effect. Uh, let's find one of these. I'll copy one of those ones. So there, there it is there. This wall's got a particular height. Uh, when we use the eyedropper, so it'll pick up. So here, if you have a look here, James, the eyedropper allows you to pick up the wall style, the thickness, the components, but there's nothing there related to the height. However, if you're using a, a level to control the height of the wall, then I don't see why it wouldn't pick up that. So let's render those. Um, so let's go back to my eyedropper. Um, just check my settings. Let's turn all of those on. Okay, copy and paste. And I get this dialog box, how do you wanna change it? I want the center line of that to line up with the center line of my structure. And you can see it's changed it. Has it changed the height? I don't think so. I think these have just ended up because of the layer wall height, they've ended up at the right height. I'm not sure the eyedropper tool is designed to pick up the height of the wall. Um, Brian, you've just posted a question. Am I allowed to say that? Um, If you export your plan for, an, for another consultant, that means they have to assign an attribute to make it look like demolished. No, you can do it. You can, if you do need to send these out to someone, what you can do is you can choose your demolished walls. Uh, let's go wall demolished. Are we in this one here? Wall demolished. If I edit this class, uh, I can edit this to have the hatch on here, which is hard fill. So that in my design layer, my walls look demolished. But when I come over here to my plan, I can change this particular class. Wall, this wall, wall demolished. Let's edit that one. In fact, what we'll do is we'll choose both of those, wall existing and wall demolished. We'll choose them both together. We'll make those both solid. We'll make them a 0.18 line, black, okay. Okay, and so you can still do it. So here in this design layer, they look demolished. Here, this looks like it's existing, and this still looks demolished. So if you want to export the DXF file and have it look the way you want, by all means do that. Of 
cool. Okay, so we've got a resource manager question. Um, so James, it looks like it just, it. I'm not even sure that it picked up the layer height and the layer's wall height. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure it does that. Um, so what's the question I was up to? In the resource palette, what's the difference between a favorites folder? Let's have a look at my, where's my resource browser gone? Palettes, resource manager, where is it? Oh, it's over there. Let's bring that in. Now, one of the things I do with my resource manager is I, sh I, I set mine, this is a Macintosh, so I've set it to be auto hide, which is this little button here. On the Windows machine, I think there's a thumbtack over here, which is again auto hide, which is really handy. It means that you can have your resource manager on the screen, but it doesn't open. Now, I think in the standard Vectorworks installation, the resource manager is here, which means that every time you go past the resource manager to go to the, the view bar, the resource manager opens and then you get up here and then it closes and you come back into your drawing it opens again so i put it as high as i can and over to the right so it's out of the way i don't even have it underneath these menus because if you have it underneath a menu and you go up to the tools menu then there's a danger that the resource manager opens while you're looking for the tools menu so i tend to push it over that side i'll make it stay open this time it should stay open from now on so we've got the ability to have favorites and we've got the ability to have user folders. This is my Vectorworks library, which is my user folder. That's that one there. User libraries and favorites. So a user library is a special location in Vectorworks and it's a special location on your, so who am I talking to? Um, Mitchell. So Mitchell, the difference is that a, a user folder is a special set of folders in a special location in your Vectorworks, or sorry, on your computer. So there's only one place on your computer to store the information to make it show up in your user libraries. Now, Vectorworks have designed, um, designed the structure in such a way that if you're looking for a hatch, so if we want to create a rectangle and assign it to a hatch, when we click here, here we could look for defaults. So these are all the ones that come with Vectorworks. And then we've got our user libraries down the bottom here. Now I actually don't have any files in my user libraries. The user library is a set of folders. I'll see if I can find it and we can talk about it. Um, I can't remember where I put it. Okay, let's go find our user folder. Let's hide that now. Vectorworks preferences, user folders, let's reveal my one. Where did it, where did it go? Oh, here it is. I'll hide all the stuff. I don't want everyone to see what I've got connected. Um, so this is my user folder for Vectorworks 2020, and it has libraries, default libraries, and it's got hatches. So if I have hatches, Mitchell, what I should do is I should put them into this location here in hatches. I should put my hatches file in there. And if I had Vectorworks 2019, then I go libraries, defaults, hatches. My hatches should be in there. But you can see what might happen is I go from Vectorworks 2018 to Vectorworks 2019. I've got to take the files from Vectorworks 2018. I've got to update them and I've got to store them in my 2019 folder. Now, Vectorworks will do a lot of that work for you. If you go and use, uh, I think I may have deleted it, but there was one which was the data, oh, Brian, what's it called? Uh, oh, Migration Manager. <clears throat> so if you use the Migration Manager, um, it will do that work for you. It'll, it'll update all your files. What happens when you want to add a new file? to your favorites. Sorry, what happens when you want to add a new file to your library? You've got to hunt through the right place, find the right location for that year, find the right folder with hatches, find the hatch file and stick it in there. I tend to be a little bit lazier than that because every year I get tired of updating my Vectorworks library. So I've created a single Vectorworks library. 
that has absolutely everything in it. So this file has all of my typical details. It's got, um, let's go back. It's got my people, it's got my Heliodon, fences, detail reference, it's got everything in it. So I've actually got a single file with absolutely everything in it. And when I want to use a hatch, okay, I select an object, I want to use a hatch. I click here, I go to my library. These are the hatches that I like to use. Here they are, soil, steel. These are the ones that are my preference. So it's real easy for me just to go and grab the things I want because I've only got one place to look. So we have a look, I've got foundations, I've got steel, I've got my timber bits and pieces, I've got fixtures, I've got my electrical, and I've had this for decades. It's no lie, I really have had this library for decades, and I just keep updating it each time, and there's only one place to store information. If I create a new hatch that I like, I, use, I go and copy that hatch, because if you create a brand new hatch here, uh, these are these are already existing, but if I if these were brand new hatches, I could drag that and I could stick it into my Archoncad hatches, and it would store that hatch in my library. It would update my library, and then next time I went to another project, I'd only have to go and look in my library, and it would it would be there. So let's go back to your question. What's the difference between a favorites? I use a favorites file and a library. So here I've got favorites files. Now you might have lots of favorites files, in which case you can make a favorites folder. So if you're doing landscaping, you might have a folder, a favorites folder just for plants, um, because you might have so many plants that um, it's too big. And then inside that favorites folder, you might have aquatic plants, palms, deciduous. So you've broken them up, hard um, ground covers, that kind of thing. So you might break them up that way. Um, but that's my way of, I know not everyone agrees with me doing it this way, but um, you know, it's every year, uh, if you're on the same cycle I am, every year Vectorworks updates, you have to go through your migration manager and hope that it copies everything in. And then it's a just, I'm afraid it was just a nightmare trying to manage all this stuff. I've got enough to manage without remembering where I put everything. So I have one file, everything goes in there, it's a favorite. I've got these other projects where I can go and grab bits and pieces if I want. Um, someone was asking about doors and windows. I didn't realize I had them here. So if you want, um, who are we talking to about the door and window symbols? Is it Mitchell? Yeah, Mitchell. So Mitchell, if we have a look here, can you see all my windows? You can see all my, um, all my windows. These are symbols. Uh, but they're also plug-in object styles. So if I go and grab one of these, and I'll go and grab the next one, and I'll grab the next one. So you know, you might notice, Mitchell, they're all numbered, and then they, their numbers almost identically match my um, the window numbers I'm using in, in reality. Um, Apologies to anyone who hasn't got Windor. These are all Windor objects. Um, but it's very similar. And so what this is, this is a window style. This is a window style. This is a window style. And it relates to a specific window in a specific place on my plan. There might be two or three of those. But what I can create is if I put those in the wall, they will work as windows in the wall. But when I also create these as an elevation, so if I create an elevation like this with an orthogonal view, I can create a window elevation schedule showing all my windows uh, with, and I can size them. And so it's a really nice trick where I can then change some things. Now, the only thing I'm allowed to change on this should be, although it looks like I can change lots of things, but really the only thing I should really be allowed to change is the schedule options and the, and the ID. And that's all I really want to be able to change on these particular windows. So Mitchell, it's like a symbol, but there's one part that I've left to be changeable. Now we get on for questions, Barbara. We must be getting close to the end. Um, must be. Flavio, I don't like the, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I don't use the migration manager, um, but it should, it should give you the, the opportunity to upgrade the bits that you want. If I go back to, uh, where's migration manager? 
so you go through and you answer a few questions and it'll update a whole lot of things and you can choose where to come from. I don't use it because I just don't need to. There's a question I think in, in some people's minds, um, if I don't use the migration manager, um, you know, what sort of things do I need to update? You know, why don't I get it to update my workspace? Well, one of my challenges with updating your workspace is, what if there's some new tools? So I tend to, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but my workspace tends to be pretty similar to a regular, to a normal Vectorworks one. I haven't changed most of these menus. Um, let's just choose my workspace and we'll see how different it is. Okay, so this is my own customized workspace. Now you might notice that my basic tool palette is quite different. There's a bunch of 3D stuff here, There's, but these are just the things I use all the time. My data tag I use a lot, my revision cloud I use a lot. So those are things that I've changed. I've also changed some of these right click options. And you might notice that mine's really short and it only has the things that I use a lot. But it doesn't take me long to change those things. And so I find that when I get a new version of Vectorworks, I like to see what the interface is like. So I like to, I like to have a look to see what new tools are there. Um, and then I make sure that I'm thinking about what tools am I using? Let's see if I can't use those tools correctly. Um, rather than just saying, let's copy our workspace entirely into the new version, because there might be some things that we don't want to carry through. Um, so that's why I, that's, that's my thoughts about the, the migration manager. So Flavio, since I've only got one, uh, since I've really only got one file to bring through, um, why, I, I won't ask the question, but I'll tell you, since I've only got the one file to update, I don't really need to use the migration manager. I do think that if you use the migration manager, there's a danger that things that you should be learning about, you don't because you're using your old workspace. Uh, can we ask you kindly to share your Archoncad library for 2020? You can ask very politely. Unfortunately, um, those of you that subscribe to my website will find it's there already to download. Um, it's about 500, 300 megabytes, something like that. It's just got everything I use. I give it to my subscribers. Um, I also give my Archoncad standards uh, to my subscribers as well, I think. Um, or if you've done my BIM course, I think you'll find my library in the BIM course as well and my standards. And the standards are very, very handy. Um, those of you that use a lot of classes, when, you, when it comes time to make new classes, uh, where's, where's it gone? When you want to make a new class, I have a standards file that I use. Uh, I can't remember where it is. Um, I'll just use one of these files, but you can grab one of these files and, and you can then go through and get all the, the, the things that you like, all the, the um, I basically have all the classes that I like to use. And I've been using these classes a lot lately, this ability to have detailing classes for doing the um, damp proof membrane and the insulation and the rigid air barrier. And these are then connected um, yeah, so I then have a, a class filter that I can use to filter the information. Uh, it works really well. So if you're not using, um, so that's my answer. Sorry, Ashot, that um, sure, you can have it. Go buy one of my courses or become a subscriber. I think it would be unfair for me to give it away to people.